rather than give a sort of straightforward narrative um, of RAF history in the Hawkesbury, um, I'm going to ask everyone to bring a little bit of their imaginations of this presentation. Uh, I want to do our best to take us out of um, out of our screens, out of our computers and devices and uh, get our heads out in the area that we're going to be talking about today, um, taking us back to a time before COVID-19. What I want you to imagine that today uh, we're all boarding a minibus at the front of the RAF base. Weather's probably uh, a little bit better than what's indicated in that screen. Um, but as we're all boarding this minibus, all 15 odd of us, uh, which is handy because it's a 22 seater, um, I, wanted to, I want to inform you that this isn't a regular defense minibus, it's a time machine. Just in case the daylight savings change today uh, wasn't confusing enough, uh, I'm going to be taking you back decades and even centuries into the past of this area to show you the history of uh, Air Force and aviation within our area. It's going to be a journey through time and space. It's a virtual drive around the Hawkesbury that will show how aviation and RAF history has played out in the buildings, uh, streets and the properties of our area. Uh, if, you, if you hopped in the car after this presentation and took this same drive, it would probably take it about 30 minutes as well. We'll be jumping back and forward through time, so I apologise if it gets a bit confusing with us leaping over events and then moving back to cover them at the end, um, but I'll do my best to make sure that we're all up to speed on where we are at a point of time. Uh, now that we're all boarded and seated uh, and driving out of the base's main gate on Percival Street, we're swinging left at the roundabout and we're going to head towards Richmond. Slide, please. I'm going to start adjusting our time control and taking us back in time. And if you cast your attention over towards the uh, right-hand side of the bus, you'll see the lowlands and the river terrace. You'll see floods appearing and disappearing over farmland as we go back through the decades. Beyond that, you'll see the Blue Mountains, sometimes with smoke and bushfires appearing on them every other summer, uh, but otherwise providing a very consistent backdrop against all areas of the RAF base over the last century. Coming around the bend at Percival Street, we're passing through the 50s and 60s now. Looking out of the left side of the bus, uh, you'll see perimeter fences changing, then disappear, uh, and trees shrink and vanish. You'll see air shows and exercises across the base, formations of aircraft taking off to go and conduct royal salutes for uh, royal visits, or solitary planes uh, landing after returning from South Vietnam. Suddenly, we're in the 1940s. You'll see uh, fields and fields of aircraft uh, passed, parked across the western uh, grass at the uh, western end of the base, the Richmond end. Warbirds, like Spitfires that you can see there, Hudsons, Mosquitoes and Venturas, just all lined up. As we're approaching into East Richmond, we're passing through the 1930s and 20s now. It looks very different to what it does now, aside from the Blue Mountains backdrop, which is sort of more or less the same. Uh, very few houses and trees like we would expect to see in, in 2021. Uh, we'll turn left at a field that will one day become Isley Park and go right at Pitt Street. We're finally about to reach our, our destination in time and space, the T intersection of Pitt Street and Windsor Street. It's early morning on Friday the 3rd of November 1911. The rail line is still there in front of us as it is in, 19 in 2021. Uh, but it looks a little bit different without the power lines and a lot of the trees uh, alongside it. It's coming up to a quarter to seven in the morning. And if I turn off the minibus engine, uh, you can hear the sound of the first aeroplane to fly over the Hawkesbury. So Haw Hawkesbury residents right now sitting down to their breakfast are hearing a 50 horsepower engine that's puttering through the sky. It's powering a Bristol box kite biplane flown by William Hart. Hart's a 26-year-old paramedic dentist uh, who recently received the first uh, civilian pilot's license in Australia. Flying on the box kite with uh, Hart is his uh, younger brother, um, his 16-year-old brother Jack. They're on a flight from Penrith to their home in Parramatta where they plan to have breakfast with their parents. It's Hart's first cross-country flight, and he's decided to take it over Castle Ray and the Hawkesbury on his way to Parramatta. Now, Hart's the son of a timber merchant, which you can probably appreciate um, in the early days of aviation with what aircraft were constructed by then. Having an old man in the timber industry is probably not a bad idea, considering if you damage your aircraft, then the repair job is going to be uh, a little bit easier to facilitate. Uh, he's establishing his flying school out of Penrith, um, and although... You know, that, that sort of passion to teach others how to fly seems like a bit of an altruistic passion to, uh, to get into aviation. Um, Hart's also, uh, it comes across as a bit of a thrill seeker, and I'll get into that in a minute. Slide, please. Now, something about this early morning flight over the Hawkesbury is going to stick with Hart, because as I said, he's got his flying school established over at Penrith, 
But in January of 1912, he's going to come back to Richmond. <coughs> Excuse me. He'll take a tour of the area and then he'll make an approach to council about using a council-owned grazing paddock called Hand Common on the north side of the rail line uh, for, using, to, for use of, as an aviation ground. Um, council will readily agree to that and, uh, and support that endeavour. Now, if we take, turn the uh, minibus back on, take it left onto Windsor Street and turn uh, the date forward to 3rd of April, 1912. Now, as we're driving along, uh, where we would normally look to see a raft base and hangars and a control tower, it's paddocks and fences and fields. But you will see one paddock that we'll pull up alongside of with a large tent and a crowd of people gathered around. The crowd here today in April 1912 is watching Hart take off in the box kite for the first time. He brought the, kite, the box kite here last month uh, by train and then had it trucked out from Richmond Station. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Amongst the crowd are a number of people that are going to go flying with him, including his sister Winnie uh, and Richmond Councilman Alderman T. Waters. Also here today, uh, Hart's Aviation Company, which is a um, company that Hart has started, which he intends to use as a flying school, uh, as well as an aircraft factory and to provide joy flights uh, at, at the aviation ground at Ham Common. Now, as we're driving along Windsor Road or Windsor Street, wherever it becomes a road, um, we're passing townspeople coming out from, walking out from Richmond to watch these first flights uh, from, what, from the location that will become Raff based Richmond. Now, I'm just gonna pull the minibus over to the side of the road so we can all hop out and watch some of the flights ourselves. Now, judging from the crowd's interest in aviation in 1912 here today, um, it's, very, it's doubtful that many of them would have even seen an aircraft um, flying before. Um, I feel like this is probably a really good spot on Windsor, Windsor Road to build something like a, a playground, a cafe, or a visitor information center uh, for people to stop and watch the airplanes. But who knows what the future might hold. Now, Hart's box kite is orbiting around us now. Um, it's a very, as you can see from the photo, it's a very fragile looking aircraft uh, with no fuselage or any real protection, protection for the occupants. Hart and Alderman Waters are clearly visible waving to everyone seated on the center aircraft, center section of the aircraft's wing. Now, for everyone here today on the tour, don't feel tempted to walk across the field to uh, go and try your luck and get a ride on the aircraft. Um, as I mentioned before, I get a sense that Hart's a bit of a thrill seeker. Um, despite his grand plans for an aviation company to have a flying school and a factory, um, in 1912, he's going to become preoccupied with two things. One of them is a flying race against an um, American aviator called Wizard Stone that'll go from Botany to Parramatta in June. It's built up in the press at the time um, and Hart wins it easily. Uh, Stone gets lost along the way and Hart uh, absolutely sinks it in. Hart's other preoccupation during 1912 though is uh, a new monoplane that he's building. So when Hart purchased his box kite and got his license in 1912, the company that sold him the box kite said, uh, did it on the condition that he wasn't allowed to build his own box kite. When, when you're an old man's a timber merchant, that's probably not a bad clause to put on that sale. So what he's done instead is he's gotten himself a new engine and he's gone out and designed a new aircraft and had it commissioned for building. Um, it'll be a two-seater, so he can take, he can use it for, uh, for joy rides and for instruction. Uh, but it's also planned to be uh, faster than the box kite um, and easier to transport around. So if he wants to drive it or put it on the back of a, tr a rail bed to um, wherever he wants to around Sydney, that it's easier to, to get around. Um, unfortunately, it's not going to end well for Hart. Uh, he's going to come back out here in August to uh, start test flying his new aircraft. But in September of 1912, during a test flight over Freeman's Reach in Cornwallis, the aircraft's going to fall about 200 feet and crash severely, injuring him. Hart will spend most of 1913 recuperating. Uh, he'll return to Ham Common in, 19, in January of 1914 uh, for a couple of more flights in his box kite. His passion for aviation has been a little bit tempered by this point. He's sort of back in it for the, the leisure element rather than seeing it as a, um, a business opportunity. Um, he'll have a few more flights in that box kite in January of 1914, and then he'll pack the aircraft up in the tent. Uh, the night, that night after he's packed it up, a, storm's gonna, a January storm is going to come through the Hawkesbury. It's going to smash the tent and knock the box kite around, requiring some pretty severe repairs uh, to the aircraft. It's a bit of a sign from God. Um, he doesn't fly again. He joins the Australian Flying Corps during the First World War, um, but he doesn't fly during the war um, or afterwards. 
Now, I'm going to ask everyone to hop back on the bus again because uh, I need to bring us forward through time. We're going to hop ahead a couple of years to Monday, the 28th of August, 1916. Now, as we're probably looking around in 2021 outside, it's clear skies and sunshine. On this day in 1916, it's bucketing down with rain. It's cold, wet and miserable with showers moving through the area. We look back at the paddock that Hart was flying in a minute ago, and we can see that there's a large crowd of people there again, but there's also a massive hangar, a giant hangar that's been constructed in the middle of the field. Um, it's located exactly where we would expect to see one of the hangars at the RAF base there today. It's not quite as large as the ones that we would have there today, but still it's very distinct shape sitting in the middle of this uh, farming paddock uh, in 1916. What we're looking at today is it's the opening day of the New South Wales government's aviation school. Now, since Hart's accident in 1911, 1912 rather, um, there's been a couple of French aviators that have come out to Ham Common to use the grounds for flying. Now, their exploits um, across Sydney, the war in Europe, um, all of these things have convinced the New South Wales government um, to establish a flying technical skill, school at, uh, at Richmond. For this, they've purchased the, um, the Ham Common grounds off uh, council and they've built a massive hangar uh, along with some workshops and some uh, accommodation blocks. Now the rain looks like it's clearing up a little bit, so we'll hop back out of the, uh, the uh, bus again, uh, and I'll give you a bit of context behind the school. Now, in 1916, the Australian military had a flying arm, the Australian Flying Corps. It was based at Point Cook in Victoria. Um, it formed in 1912, and by 1916, it had already begun sending aviators to the front line in Middle East and Europe. Meanwhile, the New South Wales government uh, during the war, it's been fundraising for planes. It's got a deal where if people donate money or, or buy war bonds to um, raise money for aeroplanes, it will meet those contributions. Um, but the Premier, Premier William Holman, he's not satisfied with that. He thinks that um, New South Wales shouldn't just be providing aircraft, it should also be providing the pilots to fly them. So um, to that end, in 1915, um, he looks at establishing a flying school um, that will train the aviators uh, to send to the war as well. Now the intent is that students will graduate from the school um, and then they'll go to Point Cook uh, and join the Australian Flying Corps and get a commission um, or they'll go to Europe and join the British Royal Flying Corps um, where they're expected to fly as pilots. Now it's a really impressive flying school that the hangar is massive it's going to be the largest hangar in Australia for a couple of years to come. Um, the American made journey um, biplanes that they're using are actually more advanced than some of the biplanes that they're using down at Point Cook. Not all of them, but um, they've got some pretty good kit out at Richmond for flying training. Um, the problem is that this is a state government owned flying school um, that wants to produce military aviators during the war. Now, the Australian Flying Court didn't ask for the school. It doesn't control the curriculum. It doesn't it has no sway over what's being taught. Um, and once graduates come out of the school, it can't guarantee them a flying job, much less a military commission as an officer. So over the next two years uh, until the armistice in 1918, there's only gonna be six courses graduate um, from, from the flying school at Richmond. And as you can, you might be able to see there, um, the patch on the right, um, the skull and crossbones um, logo from the students at the flying school indicates a bit of the mood that was carried around the school um, from 1917 onwards. Um, it, was, it was pretty low there. Um, as I said, there's only gonna be six courses graduate from this flying school. Uh, it's still a very impressive facility, but for most of the rest of the war from 1917, uh, the New South Wales government is trying to offload the school uh, and the aerodrome onto the federal government and get them to take it over. Um, it's, it's a mixed success at best, um, but its future will sort of help decide the fate of uh, the aviation in the Hawkesbury. Now, as we hop back on the bus again and get out of the rain, we'll head towards uh, Windsor and make a jump forward 20 years. We're skipping over some pretty key events in the history of the aerodrome at Richmond. As you can see there, up top left, we can see a uh, Vickers Vimy biplane. That's flown by Sir Keith and Ross Smith, um, who made the first trip from London to Australia in 1919 and then brought the Vimy to uh, Richmond in early 1920. Uh, the top right, we can see a photo, uh, a, a painting of uh, the RAF's arrival in 1925. We'll keep skipping forward through the years. Um, we're in 1928 and we can see the Southern Cross there after, um, after its trip from 
uh, San Francisco across the Pacific, landed in uh, Brisbane and then came to Richmond for a, a major refurbishment inside that same massive hangar. Uh, and then we can see a swarm of uh, silver raft biplanes. Um, if we're sort of looking out of the bus window here today, um, we can see them swirling over our heads, machine guns chattering at targets on the ground at the aerodrome. Um, but don't worry, I'll make sure I come back to some of these elements as the tour goes on. So we're coming up on Clarendon train station now and I'll take a uh, right hand turn here. On the photo on the left, you can see, um, just to orient orientate you, we're facing northwest. At the bottom is uh, Clarendon train station and that triangle um, sort of road intersection uh, that's more or less still there today on Hawkesbury Valley Way. In the middle of that photo is also the flying ground at Richmond, um, taken in around 1927, 28 or so. Um, the picture on the right is, uh, is of the, um, the aerodrome after the RAF had moved in, probably in about 1927. Um, the hangar on the right is the New South Wales State Government uh, hangar that was built in 1916. And there's a couple of more buildings there that the RAF has added. Now, coming up on Clarendon train station, um, I'll pause the date, uh, let me find it, the control, there we go. It's the 2nd of May, 1936. Now, all around us as we go into Racecourse Road are crowds that are here for the Hawkesbury show. Now it's not quite the show that you'd know from 19, from 2021 on the showgrounds. It's actually being held on the racecourse grounds. And today this Minister of Defence, the Honourable Archie Parkhill is giving a speech to the crowds. He's talking about how the government is spending 150,000 pounds to make Richmond the largest RAF station in the country. So since the RAF moved into the flying school in 1925, uh, it's constructed another hangar in some of the buildings that you can see in that photo on the, in that photo on the right. The minister's announcement today um, of a massive investment in the base, it's not, in 1936, it's not a big surprise to people in the Hawkesbury because for the last 18 months, they've watched an explosion of growth occurring at the RAF base. There's massive new hangars being added, more accommodation blocks, more headquarters buildings, and four brand new squadrons um, that were formed at the base uh, the previous month. Now, unfortunately, I can't let you out of the bus to hear Minister Park Hill's speech and enjoy the 1936 Hawkesbury show. There's just too much risk that you might interfere with our past and affect the future. So I'll just need you to stay on board. Uh, but as we turn back the bus around towards Windsor Road and what we'd know as Hawkesbury Valley Way today, uh, you can see how the base uh, as it was in 1936 and how much it's changed since the rough moved in. So the photo on the left, you can see facing south uh, towards um, the rest of Ham Common and the showgrounds. <clears throat> excuse me, there's been a massive explosion of growth at the base. It's uh, there's more hangars, more workshops, um, an officer's mess, another accommodation built around. Um, it's still a much smaller base than what we would know today. It still extends only about as far east as the train station at Clarendon. It doesn't go all the way towards Windsor and Wickerby's Creek. Um, and the perimeter, the west perimeter hasn't quite reached Richmond yet either, but it's still much bigger than what we'd, uh, what, what it was in 1925. Uh, the fence is still only about waist high, uh, but on the eve of the Second World War, so we're in 1936 now, um, 37 rather, we're looking at the biggest RAF aerodrome in Australia. And with that in mind, I'm going to turn the date forward on our bus, and as we hit September 1939, the aerial activity is going to build considerably. Uh, now, the photo on the left there is uh, that you can probably make out uh, facing um, southeast. Sorry, just trying to orientate myself. You can see rows and rows of accommodation blocks on the left that have been built to accommodate people uh, coming to the base for training during the war. On the right, you can see the um, the landing ground and at the bottom the hangars and workshops uh, most of which are still there today as a matter of fact. Now rows and rows of tin city accommodation are sprouting up now along with the cinema that's still there with us in fact it's recently been refurbished. Um, the crowds that were there at the train station a, a moment ago for the Hawkesbury show they're now formations of young men arriving uh, at the aerodrome for training or either or also being deployed away for the war. It's June 1940 now the formation of young men walking towards the train station are from the RAF number three squadron, which is the first squadron to arrive here in 1925, um, who are deploying to the Middle East uh, today. 
They'll go there with the Army 6th Division in an Army cooperation role. Um, but what they'll eventually do uh, during the war is become a fighter squadron, a fighter bomber squadron in North Africa and the Mediterranean, uh, and go on to claim the most amount of uh, enemy aircraft shot down by a RAF squadron during the war. I'll bring the time forward. We're now seeing more thousands more young men um, coming off the train station to uh, go into the recruit camp at uh, the RAF station. And in a couple of years time, we'll start seeing young women joining the uh, Women's Auxiliary Australian Air Force as well. We can also see lorries on Windsor Road towing twin engine Hudson and Boston bombers, like the photo you can see on the right there, uh, covered in a protective wrap. With all those hangars at Richmond, um, it, it was a bit of, a, it was an engineering and servicing um, workshop throughout the war, reconstructing aircraft that were being shipped out from the United States uh, for service in Australia. Now, once they've been, once they've been reconstructed, uh, they'll be deployed north, mostly to New Guinea, but in some cases to Singapore as well. As we hit 1942, there's thousands more young men marching back from the base to board the train. Uh, one of the, uh, some of them are actually going on the train for a night out in the city. Now, if I hit the right moment in June 1942, and stop it there. Uh, we'll see a tall bloke in a navy blue, in a, sorry, in a blue uniform and a, with a natty moustache. Now this bloke, it's Victorian. He's a Victorian named William Ellis Newton. Now Bill Newton, um, he's like a lot like a lot of the others at Richmond um, in 1942. Had grand plans uh, in the late 1930s for what he wanted to do that the war interrupted. In his case, uh, he was a fast bowler on the Victorian Second Eleven. Um, with a very promising career ahead of him. Unfortunately, the war intervened and he joined the Air Force to become a pilot, initially serving as an instructor uh, before coming to Richmond uh, to fly the Boston bomber uh, that you can see there on the left. Now, at the moment in June 1942, um, his job is flying the Boston on these long coastal patrol missions alongside along New South Wales. Um, they're long and monotonous, basically looking out at, at the waters to find an su enemy submarine. Um, it'd be a boring job if it weren't for the fact that last month there was a submarine attack in uh, Sydney Harbour. So where everyone's got their wits about them uh, with that memory fresh in their mind. Now, right now, we're watching Bill Newton boarding the train into the city for his night off. Um, pretty soon, the coastal reconnaissance missions for Bill are going to finish up. Um, he's going to be deployed to New Guinea with number 22 squadron. And he's going to build a bit of a reputation there uh, for pressing home attacks on Japanese targets uh, that are learning the nickname Firebug. His service in New Guinea is going to be spectacular but brief. In March 1943, his aircraft will be damaged in combat, forcing him to ditch uh, into the water. He'll be captured, and at the end of that month, he'll be executed. What he'll never know, not now, boarding the train or, or even before he's executed, is that in October of 1943, his actions in New Guinea will earn him the Victoria Cross. It's the only RAF recipient of the Victoria Cross in the Pacific. As we move the time forward at Richmond, the war, if it's continuing, still seeing thousands of men being trained, at, some of them being trained to operate radar sets uh, that they'll take up to New Guinea and the Dutch East Indies um, to act as an early warning. And there's aircraft being rebuilt and serviced inside the hangars. Squadrons of different aircraft, like Spitfires in the middle there, being deployed through Richmond on their way north. Over our heads, the skies are bu buzzing with aircraft many of them destined for the front line. We can also see paratroopers descending over the lowlands, not unlike they would be today. Now, it's late 1944, going into 1945. Uh, if you cast your attention back on the ground at the aerodrome, there's something um, happening on the airfield. There's a prepared surface runway being constructed. Now, since 1912, aircraft have simply taken off from the grass field at Ham Common, but this new runway will allow heavier aircraft to take off and land. As we turn left and drive the butt, sorry, turn right and turn, drive the bus towards Windsor, we'll see the dome of St. Matthew's Anglican Church ahead of us. To our left, um, the paddocks that stand between the RAF station and Windsor are now being cleared and prepared as an extension of the RAF base. And you can see the difference in those two aerial photos there from 1942 to 1955, the extension of the base uh, eastward towards Windsor. It's another step towards what we would be, what we would probably recognize today. Now it's 1950 on the time control in the minibus. The extended runway towards Windsor is being constructed. But as we move through the 1950s, RAF Base Richmond is still flying a lot of the same types of aircraft that it was flying during the war. So Dakotas, Bowfighters, Mustangs and Wiraways. Um, but as the new runway is being extended, um, 
there's there's talk within the RAF that it's it's necessary to build a longer runway still to support jet powered aircraft that are going to be introduced in the coming decade. Now it's 1952. Slide two. It's 1952. I've got a newspaper with me on the minibus that I'm showing. Um, and there's a bit of a shock that's just gone through council because there's a rumor that's going around that the RAF plans to build another runway at Richmond. Only this one's gonna go north-south. It's gonna run at about 11,000 feet and it's gonna be one of the longest runways in Australia. The new runway is gonna take over the entire Ham Common uh, grazing land um, to the south, intersecting with Windsor Road and the rail line. Um, roughly, approximately where I said that uh, they should build that cafe and playground earlier on in this tour. Now, this is a big issue for council because it hasn't been formally briefed. It, it's, it's come to council as a rumor, so they haven't been told the left and right of what the plan is. They've, they've had rumors to go on. Um, their great concern is that if a runway cuts across Windsor and uh, Windsor Road and, um, and the rail line, that essentially they'll be cut off from the rest of um, the rest of Sydney. Obviously, you could probably still go around the south end or build something around the north, but they don't want to see themselves being separated from the rest of the Hawkesbury, as it were, uh, by a massive runway. Now, the RAF comes back in time and says, don't worry about it. We're going to build a tunnel for the rail, uh, for the road and rail line. So we'll just go underneath the runway and, you know, Richmond will, um, will still be connected. In the meantime, we'll probably divert traffic around Percival Street, which is being constructed at the time as well. Um, what's really interesting at the time though, is that the RAF doesn't have anything that actually needs to use this runway. So there's no aircraft in the RAF that need a 11,000 foot runway, um, to be able to take off and land and nor, nor is there, I guess, an order or a plan to buy anything that needs a runway that long. What it is, is similar to how the RAF invested in the RAF base Richmond before the war and building hangars and additional workshops in anticipation of the war. It's a plan to future-proof Richmond so that when, if and when they ever do need to build a uh, buy large aircraft, uh, that they will still be able to operate through Richmond. So it's not, it's not to match anything that they're buying, but the expectation that if they ever do buy something, it will be able to land in Richmond. Now, as we drive the minibus on towards uh, Windsor, um, as we know from our time, that north-south runway is never going to be constructed. Uh, driving along the base in 1955, um, there's a couple of puddles and, um, and drainage issues um, from the east-west runway at the moment. And if we look out at the, uh, at the air aerodrome, at the runway works, we can actually see some uh, repair works that are taking place uh, on the runway. Uh, the issue is the, the, the extended east-west runway that we, we know now, it's not draining water properly. It hasn't been terribly well constructed and needs repairs uh, about three or four years after it's been initially extended. Um, it's causing issues for the adjacent farming um, properties. It's kind of got Windsor Council offsite as well because of a lot of the earthworks and movement of, of uh, soil around um, has affected them. Um, and there's also some complaints about the intersection of Hawks what, what will become Hawkesbury Valley Way and Percival Street as well. So in 1955, amidst runway repairs, um, the RAF kind of quietly abandons the plan for a north-south runway. Um, I haven't found, I guess, the minute or the uh, the decision brief that formally says we're not going to do it anymore. It just sort of fades away from public um, public reporting. And ultimately, they're going to need to use that budget on buying aircraft to replace old aircraft from the war that can probably still use the existing runway at Richmond. But it's an interesting piece of uh, what if for the Hawkesbury, if there'd have been a, um, like I said, a 12, 11,000 foot runway um, constructed across the rail line in 1955. Now, as we're coming up on Windsor, I'll hit pause on our time travel again. Uh, sorry, just better be really careful playing with time. Uh, there's no mobile reception in 1963. Okay, there we go. So I've hit pause on the 2nd of November, 1963. Now, today's not really a turning point in RAF uh, history, a uh, RAF-based Richmond history, but it's worthwhile stopping here for a spectacle. If we look at the left side of the bus, you'll see St. Matthew's Anglican Church. It's almost 150 years old in 1963. Um, and it's been undergoing renovation works over the last year or so. Now, today is a special occasion. As you can see there, there's a brand new Iroquois helicopter. It's only been delivered to the RAF last year. 
It's being used to hoist across an orb back onto the top of the church after the renovation. The silver and white Iroquois carrying the orb and across an orb on a long cable before a crowd of thousands on Don't Worry Oval and McQuaid Park in Windsor, with the pilot carefully maneuvering into position right about midday as he drops it on. Now with the cross on latch, the helicopter hovers back to uh, Rath Base Richmond, uh, but soon comes back to um, St. Matthew's and uh, and does it all over, re recreates creates the act all over again. And that's the photo that we can see there. Um, not because it didn't do the job the right the first time, but because for the benefit of the uh, television crews and the media who missed it on the first time around, because it went ahead too quick. As a, uh, as a public affairs officer, I can appreciate that effort. Now let's carry on with our journey. We'll turn left at Macquarie Street and we'll head up through Windsor uh, through the 1960s, past Windsor, past Windsor Hospital before it became the old Windsor Hospital on our left, um, where I just want to touch on some of the concerns about aircraft noise in the Hawkesbury that were expressed in the 1950s and early 60s. Now, surprisingly, aircraft, hist aircraft noise in the early history of the base and the flying school um, it's not really a big community issue that I've been able to find. Um, in fact, there's probably only about four instances of complaints against the base around aircraft activity registered before the Second World War, or at least um, publicly reported on before the Second World War. Um, one's about a firing range in Londonderry with people in Londonderry a bit unhappy that there's an airplane that's you know, potentially gonna come through and strafe them. Another one's about um, the local community upset that um, <laughs> that aircraft are conducting firing practice on Sundays while, well, you know, it, it's a day of rest and they're in church. So you can imagine the background of this presentation being given with some ch chattering guns in the background. Um, that's what they had to deal with in the late 20s and early 30s. Um, there's, uh, there's another complaint about increase to flying activity in 1935 uh, and one more um, about an incident in 1929 that I'll talk about later in this tour. So by and large, before the war, um, the community is largely pretty accepting accepting of the aircraft noise. Um, considering the safety record, um, which I'll touch on later, and the cavalier approach of the pilots, that's pretty remarkable. Following the war though, there's a bit of a willingness within the community, whether it's council, it's the organizations like the Windsor Hospital next to us now, or residents to air their grievances a little bit more publicly and, and say that they're unhappy. Um, one of the issues, especially for the hospital in the, in the late 1950s and early 60s is, the extension of the east-west runway and the introduction of jet aircraft means that there's now a lot more um, noise and activity flying over the base um, than what there was beforehand. A lot of it louder and probably more disturbing to the patients. Now, there we go, there's our noise. Um, early in the 1950s, the RAF sort of waves away the issue and says, don't worry about it. Once we construct the north-south runway, it's not going to be a problem anymore. You know, the aircraft will be taking off in a different direction and not disturbing the communities at either end. Obviously, that runway doesn't get built. And by the end of the 50s, um, it's become a bit of a sensitive issue for council because the RAF still, um, despite abandoning the runway plan, it's still investing heavily in Richmond. It's moving new squadrons of transport aircraft to the base. It's commissioned new housing in South Windsor and will soon commission new housing in Hobartville. The problem for council is it doesn't want to get the RAF offside because of all this money and new um, uh, residents coming into the area. But obviously, you know, if, if the hospital and residents in the hospital, patients in the hospital are upset, then that's an issue for it as well. Uh, the issue never really goes away. It sort of reaches a stalemate in the early 1960s that carries on um, more or less for the next couple of decades um, until the retirement of the Boeing 707 in 2008, which, you know, was an aircraft that was banned from flying into civilian airports by that point because of the air, excess noise that it made. The, the issue sort of hasn't gone away, but it's not quite as um, sensitive a topic as it was maybe 60 or 70 years ago. Um, there's far less flying activity at the base today. And I would say that most of the residents are probably used to the, the flying activity. Um, most of the complaints that we would receive would be unfamiliar. So uh, unfamiliar flying activity. So aircraft that are in an area that we don't typically fly or different um, different sounding aircraft um, that residents wouldn't necessarily be used to. Um, so as we carry on for the bus tour, we're approaching the top end of Windsor. Now, if we went right and went out towards Pitt Town, we'd be able to go out and check out Airstrip Road, which was used as a dispersal airstrip during the 1940s, uh, during the war. Um, 
it was one of three or four dispersal aerodromes around the Hawkesbury and Marsden Park that the RAF had to sort of get aircraft away from the RAF base. It was kind of a safety measure. So if the RAF base got attacked, you wouldn't put all your eggs in one basket and lose them all. Um, but at the same time, it also le lessened the burden on the RAF base to support all of the aircraft coming through. You had a satellite airfield that aircraft could come and go as they needed to. If you want to take a look at uh, Airstrip Road, you can still drive on that road uh, to this day, but there's probably very little to, you know, evidence of what its, once, what its purpose was, uh, aside from the name. Uh, instead of going out there, though, we're going to go left at the top end of Windsor. Uh, I'm going to take us over Bridge Street, past Thompson Square. So wave to the future side of the museum uh, as we go past and over Windsor Bridge. I'm going to take uh, Freeman's Reach Road and head follow along the Hawkesbury River. Now, the opposite bank from us is uh, Cornwallis. And if I bring the time forward to the present day of 2021, you might, well, it's, it's a Sunday and a long weekend, so you're not going to see much flying activity today. But if we look towards the aerodrome, you might expect to see some paratroop training over Rickby's Creek drop zone or other aircraft in the circuit. Now, while we're driving opposite the uh, riverbank at Cornwallis, I want to talk about two of the darker moments in the RAF base's history. In the last hundred years, there have been a number of aircraft accidents around the district, probably about 40 within the Hawkesbury with the loss of about uh, 40 lives. It's hard to build a firm figure because there's a couple of accidents that occurred during the, um, during the Second World War that it's difficult to determine um, who was killed, who was injured, where it took place, uh, what happened. But that's, that's about the numbers that we're sort of dealing with within this local area from, from the RAF base. Uh, one incident that I'll talk about now is it occurred not, not far from Windsor in January 1929. Uh, involved a man named Albert Charles Smith, who was a former alderman uh, and respected farmer within the Hawkesbury. Now, each day he came from his house in, terrace, in the terrace in Windsor uh, to work on his farm in Cornwallis. And on the day in question, he's in the field with a number of other workers, including his son. Now, flying overhead of them is Sergeant Robert Somerville. Now, Robert's a uh, RAF pilot with number three squadron. He's flying a de Havilland Gypsy Moth biplane, which you can see there, which had been delivered to the RAF about a year or two before this incident. Um, Somerville, by chance, just also happens to be engaged to one of Smith's daughters, and he's putting on a bit of a show um, in the Gypsy Moth over Cornwallis. He's got an aircraft mechanic uh, in the second seat um, as a bit of a joyride, and he's entertaining farmers with an aerial display of loops and low passes. Now, when I say entertain, um, the RAF pilots in those early days had built a bit of a reputation for flying over and buzzing farmers in the Hawkesbury, um, to the extent that the farmers would often say afterwards that they had to throw themselves onto the ground to avoid being hit. Um, as I said before, there's not too many noise complaints or aircraft com no complaints um, in the local media or other sources at the time. So it's a bit interesting that this isn't more of an issue until now. Now, Today, it's going to end in tragedy. After making a couple of low passes over the farm, Somerville brings his moth much lower. Tragically, he strikes down Smith, partially decapitating him and dragging his body. The biplane crashes, and after the two crew are pulled from the wreck by witnesses, it's said that Somerville then collapsed, weeping over Smith's body. Uh, but, Somerville, um, but Somerville would later claim that he had no memory of the accident when it occurred. He's charged with manslaughter. Uh, and during the trial um, for his case, he actually cuts a pretty gaunt figure, as you, one might expect. Um, there are many witness statements from the other farmers, but as I said, Somerville claims no memory and he's acquitted of the charge, but he is demoted. He, he loses his um, flying position for a couple of years, but he's uh, later returned to flying status. Ultimately, he would marry Smith's daughter uh, in a weird sort of twist of fate. Uh, he would have a son with her, but tragically in, 19, in December of 1936, uh, Somerville was killed in a flying accident at Point Cook when another biplane collided with his aircraft. Um, the other accident that I'll discuss today occurred in 1959. It also occurred in, um, in Cornwallis, but happened further along the, the trip uh, up towards Baker's Lagoon. Uh, it took the lives of eight RAF personnel um, when the Lockheed Neptune crashed near the Baker's Lagoon. Now, to give you a bit of background about the Neptune, um, it, it was a anti-submarine and maritime reconnaissance aircraft in the 50s and 60s. It often gets a little bit overlooked. Um, in 1954, the RAF relocated its Neptune squadron to Richmond 
Um, the, the idea that there was to bring them closer to where the Navy had a fleet base in Sydney so that they could exercise together. Uh, what makes the Neptune a, a big deal for Richmond? As I said before, it often gets overlooked, um, but it's the first squadron and aircraft at Richmond that regularly is in, con is, uh, in contact with the rest of the world. Now, Richmond's been hosting international aviators more or less from the beginning. It had French expatriate aviators at the start. Um, it had pioneering aviators coming to the base in the 20s and 30s uh, on international trips. And during the war in the 50s, it was sending squadrons overseas. The difference with the Neptune and number 11 squadron at Richmond is it's, it's going on these sort of trips as a matter of course, as a matter of normal practice, rather than being um, the, these sort of deployments or uh, milestone events. It's, it's regularly having aircraft come and visit them from other countries and it, it itself is, uh, is going off on trips. Um, it, they even go on a round of the world voyage um, at one point in the 50s. Now, what they're doing in early 1959 is preparing for Operation Sabre Ferry, which is, it's a mission to move a squadron of RAF Sabre fighters from Williamtown near Newcastle, all the way up to Malaya. Now to make the journey, the, the Sabre is only a single engine, single person fighter aircraft with fairly short range. Uh, they'll need to make stops in Darwin, Dutch controlled West Papua, then the Philippines, Borneo, and finally Malaya. If you look at a map, it's a really long trip to, uh, to get around Indonesia at the time. During the trip, the Sabres are going to rely on the Neptune. They need a navigation aid, uh, something to provide the weather updates. And if worse happens, uh, they need a Neptune to act as an emergency search and rescue aircraft um, for the rescue. Now, on the 4th of February, 1959, the crew of this Neptune, uh, the crew of a Neptune are taken off from Richmond and they're going to practice this uh, cooperation mission with the Sabres before they go the following week. Uh, just making sure that radio procedures uh, are working all correctly before they go. After they've completed this task, they head back to Richmond. At around 11.14 a.m., as the Neptune is flying just north of Wilberforce, there's an explosion in the right-hand engine. The crew immediately calls for an emergency landing, but radios again shortly thereafter to say that they're going to have to crash land at, uh, on the lowlands. Before they can, the fire in the engine has weakened the structure of the aircraft's wing, and it's folded up over the, the rest of the aircraft. The rest of the aircraft is essentially speared into the river bank and, uh, and hit um, the banks of the Hawkesbury River near Baker's Lagoon. The whole thing is over in less than two minutes from when the fire began. All eight crew on board are immediately killed. Uh, the crash also almost claims the life of uh, a local farmer, Peter Sacchetti, uh, who was working on cauliflower crops. And you can see one of the photos there, some of the damage to his um, farming equipment and vehicles as well. He's badly burnt. Um, but uh but he survives the accident's a tragedy um there's a funeral procession that you can see there seven of the um the crew on board are buried at rookwood cemetery um there's also a um a stained glass window uh memorial that's um installed at the anglican church at richmond at, uh, at the raf base um, a lot of these men left family partners and children um after when they uh, after their crash now the cause of the crash is investigated there's no firm cause established for why the fire started. Um, the likely culprit is what's called a power, rec power recovery turbine. So if you can imagine a piston engine spitting out lots of exhaust gas on a Neptune, that gas gets captured by another turbine as it's on its way out of the aircraft. That turbine feeds that power back into the engine to turn the propeller. It's probably not a completely accurate uh, description, but that's the best summary that I can give. Um, that, that turbine exploded. It breached a firewall in the back of the uh, engine block, um, which allowed hot gases from the fire to ignite the fuel in the wing. It's the only RAF Neptune crash we'll ever have, the only loss of a uh, Neptune or crew that we'll, uh, we'll have. Um, and it's the last, also the last major fatal accident um, with a RAF aircraft in the Hawkesbury area. Now, by no means are these accidents the only ones to have occurred in the area. Uh, there are a number of properties around the Hawkesbury that, we've, that have witnessed their own tragedies, one of which I'll mention later on. Um, but through a combination of things of, um, I guess, evolving culture and professionalism, safety and good fortune, um, accidents around the Hawkesbury over the last 60 years have become increasingly rare. Now, so continuing along in 2021 in the minibus, we'll head towards Freeman's Reach. We'll come up uh, Gorex Lane and towards uh, Kermon Road. 
and then we're going to take a left at, at Terrace Road. Um, ahead of us is Street and Lookout. And it's a good vantage point to stop and look at the base and ask the question, why is it where it is? Um, the weather's a little bit more cloud here today, but the, the view that we can sort of see there on our presentation is not unlike the weather that's out there today. Now, the reason why the RAF base is where it is, the answer's sort of right in front of us. It's the Hawkesbury River. So what's the relationship between the base and the river? The only immediate role that the river has sort of played for the RAF base was transporting a massive hangar from uh, RAF mines further up the coast uh, to Windsor by barge in 1960 so that they could pull it out to the RAF base and construct it there. That's really the only evidence that I can find of the, RAF of the river directly supporting the RAF base. The river, however, it's, it's played a role in developing and shaping the area over the last uh, two or three hundred years, um, especially in regards to agriculture, that have made it a superb place for aviation, especially in the early parts of the 20th century. Up until 230 years ago, from this vantage point on the, on the terrace, um, we would see Darug cultivating yams along the riverbanks of the Dirubbin. Um, this was an important food source for them. Um, before they were, and that was recognized by the, uh, the European settlers when they came in in the early days of the colony when they forced out the, uh, the Darug from the area. Um, they came here to establish farms to feed the colony. Now, the Hawkesbury River served two functions then it was supporting those farms, and it was also the means of transporting crops um, to the wider colony for the next couple of decades. Um, now, Windsor Road is constructed over, after a couple of years, uh, but it's not until 1864 that we see a rail line opened up towards, uh, from Parramatta to Richmond, uh, which then allows the quicker transport of people and bulk produce to the city. Now, what does any of this have to do with a RAF base? Well, mostly be because by the early 20th century, the combination of the farms, the rail, uh, the proximity to Sydney, um, and the towns that had sort of developed to support that industry um, all of that pedigree made it a really good place for aviation. The land was mostly flat, had a lot of cleared areas so that um, if an aircraft, if a pilot needed to make, get on the ground really quickly and he couldn't make it back to the airfield, then there was a fairly good chance that he was going to be able to get onto a flat piece of earth. Um, the presence of the towns as well, there's a source of labour and I guess um, professional um, uh, skills as well, doctors, engineers, etc., to be able to support um, construction of an, of an aerodrome or a RAF base. Um, the rail line also means that you can transport aircraft out to the aerodrome by surface or uh, return it back into the city to workshops there for repairs. Now, when William Hart came to Richmond in 1912, he'd already been flying at Penrith for the couple of months in the previous year, but he called Hawkesbury the finest ground for aviation in Australia, which is a pretty bold claim considering they'd only been aviation in Australia for a couple of years. Um, he was followed at Richmond by a couple of other aviators and the New South Wales government. Uh, by the end of the First World War, there were a couple of other flying grounds in Sydney, like Mascot, where the airport is today. Um, but not, not long after the RAF was established in March 1921, um, the decision brief came down for looking at a site for an aerodrome in Sydney. Uh, and Wing Commander Richard Williams chose Richmond as the location for their airfield in Sydney. Um, William's assessment sort of echoed Hart's sentiment that the ground and country at Richmond was excellent for flying. It had, but he also had additional reasons. Um, from street and lookout, on a clear day, you'll be able to see all the way into the city. In the 1920s, you wanted an airfield that was close enough to the city to provide air defense and reconnaissance of the coast, but you didn't want it so close to the city, especially like Mascot, where it might be at risk of enemy bombardment from, um, from naval ships. Um, if we look away to our left, you can also see Windsor. Windsor's connected by road to Sydney, but in the early 1920s, it's also connected to Newcastle via the Putty Road, which is the primary uh, road route from uh, Sydney to um, Newcastle at the time, which was of value to uh, the RAF. Um, thanks to the New South Wales government, there was already a hangar and workshops constructed at Richmond, and the RAF determined in the early 20s, uh, the RAF had plenty of room for expansion in time of war, which we can subsequently see here, looking at the view from Street and Lookout, the RAF then did move out into over the next 90 years. Now, if we hop back on the bus again, we'll continue on our tour now, heading along Terrace Road towards North Richmond. Looking at the view of the base and of the Blue Mountains, um, some of the things that made Richmond a good airfield in 1921 
um, despite all the changes in the last century, it still makes it a really good air base in 2021. It's still well positioned within Sydney. It's close enough to provide Sydney to, to provide support to defence bases uh, in the Sydney Basin, like Holsworthy. Uh, but it's also far enough west from the city to go flying without disturbing too many people, especially if we head over the, the uh, Blue Mountains and out into central New South Wales to go to some of our training airfields. Um, it's also got proximity to airspace and infrastructure, like local drop zones and training airspace, um, where we don't typically interfere with um, commercial or general aviation routes as well, so we can do our own thing out in the West. Um, that kind of flexibility, it's made it an attractive base, um, not just for defence to come flying, but also for state emergency services. So um, you'll often see aircraft coming here from um, ambulance or other emergency services coming out here for training. Uh, or we've seen in recent years with uh, rural fire service with their firefighting, firefighting fleet being based at Richmond. We're even now starting to see um, aircraft from, um, from Singapore and from uh, US bases in Japan coming to Richmond because I guess the, the, the support they get and the flexibility and, and freedom to be able to fly in open airspace and do what they need to do is, um, it can't be matched in their own countries. Now, in spite of all best efforts and rumours over the last 30 years about closing the base, I think it's fairly say the value of the base, especially in Sydney, has been demonstrated over the last 30 years, especially during uh, events such as bushfires and floods. Uh, one thing the base has enjoyed fairly, it's enjoyed fairly consistent community support. As I mentioned before, there have been issues with aircraft noise and other sort of issues uh, within the local area about the base. Um, but it's also, I guess, um, that, that there's a support for the base being here and not changing into um, either a, you know, a, a, a private aerodrome or a civilian airport that um, a lot of other bases and airfields in Australia wouldn't uh, otherwise enjoy. Now, as we're driving along Terrace Road, coming through uh, North Richmond and turning left, um, I'll take us through the polo fields and into Richmond. Uh, and I'm also gonna take the time, time dial back, way, way back, almost a century. So we're coming back from 2021, lots of changes going along the polo fields. We're seeing that rail line pop up and disappear. And as we get to the evening of Wednesday, the 8th of July, 1925. Now, as we pull up along to West Market Street, we're gonna take a left in the minibus and park it on the side of the road. We're outside the School of Arts. The School of Arts is still there today, obviously. Um, and there's a fairly big crowd here tonight. They're attending a citizen's welcome for the reception for the Air Force, uh, which had arrived at Richmond a little over a week beforehand. Now, the arrival of the uh, RAF in the Hawkesbury was obvious cause for excitement. Um, at the next stop on this tour, I'll sort of, I'll talk a little bit about the, I guess, um, some of the uncertainty about the RAF coming here and, um, and the fight to get them here. But now that they were here, it was, it was obviously very exciting. Um, all the more so when you consider that, um, June 1925, the month before the RAF arrived, um, there'd actually been a fairly heavy flood in the Hawkesbury or, or across uh, New South Wales, I should say. Within the local area, um, the flood reached about four and a half metres over Windsor Bridge. I think the flood records show it was about 14, oh, sorry, 11.4 metres, which is about a metre under what we experienced earlier this year. Um, certainly, um, it was enough to damage property and, um, and crops and welfare of the local um, agricultural community. Um, with the damage that the floodwaters did. As the floodwaters receded, um, a group in Victoria, a group of 11 uh, aircraft set out from Point Cook for Richmond. Now, in some instances in the early days, that flight from Point Cook to Richmond might only take four or five hours, uh, but the arrival at Richmond took about two or three days for most of those aircraft. As I headed north, as I mentioned before, there was heavy, there was heavy flooding and rains across New South Wales, instances of aircraft becoming damaged or bogged in landing accidents or becoming unserviceable along the way. So it was almost a case of, uh, as they sort of moved along north, there were less and less aircraft coming along each time. In June, in, on June 30, 1925, the first aircraft arrived at Richmond at around 2 p.m. It's painted, it's illustrated here. It was a DH-9 biplane flown by Flight Lieutenant Frank Lucas who had become the uh, commanding officer of number three squadron at RAF station in Richmond. Now, Lucas, uh, he was a West Australian. He was a veteran of Gallipoli and Sinai. Uh, and then he commissioned in 1916 into the Australian Flying Corps and flew in Palestine. Now, 
the moment's been immortalized in several paintings. The one here that you can see tells the legend the best that Lucas spotted the airfield through a gap in the clouds uh, and flew in under a rainbow for a landing, which is, you know, I don't, I don't know how your, um, your Old Testament goes, but sounds like a, um, a, a different retelling of the Noah's Ark uh, story on, in some respects. Um, following Lucas that afternoon came two uh, SE-5 biplanes uh, from the same squadron and more aircraft arrived on the July 1st. Now, the citizens reception at the School of Arts the following week, there was about 30 RAF members that came along to it. Gauging from the summary that ran in the Gazette um, afterwards, um, it was a pretty warm evening um, from, from the local community. The language in the speeches, um, one of the reverends is um, tipping the single men for the RAF that um, they would find love on the te local tennis courts and he'd be happy to perform the marriage. Um, but he would also be grateful if the RAF would give joy flights to newly wed couples and take them up to heaven, so to speak, his words. Um, Frank Lucas, sorry, Flight Lieutenant Lucas, who is pictured on the left in that group photo. Um, he addressed the reception as well, um, said that none of the men had felt like strangers in Richmond. Uh, and the kindness of the shown to them from the locals was welcomed and that the government had chosen an ideal location for an airfield at, uh, in Richmond. Um, there's even a comment from one of the other Raffies that um, they were glad to get out of Point Cook because it was a terrible hole. Sorry, I've got to throw that, uh, that jab in there. After supper and speeches, everyone at the, the reception enjoyed music and dance. Now, for all of us here on this tour, unfortunately, we can't go join them in the revelries tonight. Um, but there will be an opportunity for a drink uh, at the next stop. So if we hop back on the bus, we'll go around the corner. Now we're driving up uh, West Market Street. We're going to turn right onto West Windsor Street. Uh, we're going to go about 100 metres and, and uh, pull over at Richmond Park. And in the same time, I'm going to turn the dial back to the 30th of November, 1923. We're outside the Royal Hotel, still there today. Looks a little bit different. And we're going to go inside for a quick drink. Um, and we're going to talk about the role of council and uh, the establishment of Rough Base Richmond. Now, the date that I've got to set at is November 1923. It's a funny period in the, RAF, in the history of the aerodrome at Richmond. It's that in-between period, beginning with the establishment of the Air Force in March 1921 at Point Cook and the arrival of the RAF at uh, Richmond in June 1925. Now, inside the Royal today, it's the Honourable Eric Bowden on the left there. Who, uh, who's been the Minister of Defence since about February. With him is the member from Macquarie, Arthur Manning, along with the Mayor, Alderman John Percival, a couple of other Aldermen and other local residents. Now, earlier today, Minister Bowden was out at the aerodrome and he's talking about when he expects to see the RAF uh, begin operating from Richmond. I can imagine the scene at the, Royal, at the bar at the Royal on a humid Friday afternoon in November, couple of regulars coming in off the street to get their uh, get some cold drinks. Seeing the crowd at the bar, sort of trying to suss out what was going on, what they were talking about and trying to get uh, a word in or catch a word about what, uh, what they were planning. Now, as I mentioned before, the RAF was established in, 1920, in March of 1921. It's not long after it's established that the decision brief comes down that it wants, to ch it wants Richmond as its base in, uh, in Sydney. Um, in fact, the, the brief is signed off in July of 21, and by December, they've already started sending um, teams up to Richmond to start assessing what work is required and what additional construction is required for them to, um, to move in. The problem with the Air Force in 1921 is it's a fledgling service, it's a post-war government, and there's competing resource priorities and uh, resources uh, for a brand new service that... Um, who, that, that doesn't have air, new aircraft. It's, it's basically been handed down um, secondhand aircraft from the First World War. It's basically got to invent an air force. It's also doing that in competition with the army and the navy for funding priority within defense. So it's got these ideas on how it wants to evolve and where it needs to be. It just doesn't have the money to be able to do it. So it wanted the RAF wanted to move to Richmond as early as 1922, but can't get the money together uh, to buy the air, to aerodrome at Richmond. Now, throughout this tour, I've largely omitted the role of council in the RAF base, which I'll, I'll cover off on now. It was Richmond Municipal Council that gave permission to William Hart to use Ham Common for aviation in 1912 that said, yep, we want that to be taking place here. 
It was then council that sold that land to the state government to start a flying school in 1915, 1916. Now, as early as June 1917, the state government, it wants to offload the flying school. It's trying to get the federal government to step in and buy the aerodrome in the school. Uh, and following the war, because they haven't, the, the government hasn't got the money or the interest to be able to buy the uh, aerodrome yet. It wants anyone to move in or buy the aerodrome or else it's going to scrap the buildings and take what's left to workshops at Point Cook, at um, Mascot. Now, from the end of the first of the First World War, Richmond Council has got two objectives with the aerodrome. Don't let the state government knock it down and get someone else, preferably the federal government, to take it over, either as a reserve aerodrome, so if they're based at Point Cook, but if they need to stage through, um, through Richmond for an exercise or for deployment or during war, that they can use the aerodrome there, or move into Richmond on a permanent basis. Council absolutely does not want the aerodrome to be scrapped. Um, there's a repeated lie within RAF histories. It, it, it first appeared in 1970, and then it's come back in um, official RAF histories of the RAF at the time, that council wanted the land to revert to farming, which is stupid because there's one thing that the area hasn't lacked for the last hundred years, and that's farming land. Council absolutely wanted that to remain an aerodrome. Um, in 1919, council sends a deputation to the New South Wales government, to the Premier, to keep the aerodrome. You would think that um, their argument would be built around what the contribution to the community is and the influx of employment and you know the money from that aerodrome finding its way into the community. The case that's pitched is actually more strategic than that. It's actually sort of built around, this is a tremendous infrastructure investment for Australia. Uh, there's a massive hangar can house large bombers. We absolutely need to keep this for the security of the nation, which is kind of big strategic thinking for a municipal council um, in Richmond at the time. But it might have been a little bit of the uh, the Great War mentality um, affecting their um, their forward planning. Now, throughout 1921 and 1922, there's this fear that the that the uh, government is going to follow through, the state government rather, is going to follow through on its promise to scrap the aerodrome before the RAF has a chance to come through with the money to buy it. In February 1923, Eric Bowden becomes the uh, seen here in the uh, in the Royal Hotel having a beer becomes the Minister of Defence and immediately after this, Council sends a deputation to the state government saying, ask the federal government and ask uh, Minister Bowden um, to take over the airfield. The following month, the aerodrome's purchase is announced for £9,000. The cheque doesn't clear for a couple of years after that, but the federal government bought um, the core of the, the aerodrome for £9,000. Considering the state government wanted £14,000 a couple of years before, um, I think Defence got a pretty good deal on uh, on Richmond. It wouldn't be accurate to say council is solely responsible for getting the RAF to Richmond. As I've sort of, as I've talked about, the RAF had its own reasons for wanting to come here, but it's definitely worth recognising council's work in campaigning the state government to hold on to the aerodrome um, until such time as it was able to sell it to the federal government. Now today at the Royal, the crowd is listening to uh, Eric Bowden. So uh, as he sort of describes, yes, the RAF's gonna come to Richmond, here are all the things that we're going to have to construct it beyond the hangar and the workshops that, there, that are there to turn it into a RAF station. So it's not just um, hangars and, uh, and headquarters, it's things like messes, um, power and water supply, the whole, the whole sort of nucleus of what you need to be able to, to have a, a RAF base running. Um, council wants the accommodation and the messes to be built closer to Richmond, sort of over towards East Richmond. The minister says, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to build it over towards where the hangars are because we don't want to waste time for people marching back and forward from their accommodation blocks to the hangars all day and losing that time uh, when they could be out working. Now, it's uh, it's still a little while in 1923 before the RAF arrives, but it's it, progress is, in, is, uh, is moving along. In November 1924, a public works committee uh, visits the aerodrome. That's them illustrated on the right there. Um, that basically comes out with the um, to, to start planning the construction of uh, what's required um, at, at uh, the aerodrome. Their works are budgeted to cost around one hundred and eighty-two thousand pounds. So, if anything, buying the hangar and the aerodrome is sort of the cheap part of the equation. Um, building all of the stuff that turns it into our air force base is uh, is expensive. Um, unfortunately, the uh, the public works committee won't stop at the royal um, for a drink. They lost. Uh, but the Gazette at the time will run a visit, uh, it'll, it'll run the report of their visit to the area with a subheadline reading, Situation Considered Ideal. 
which feels like a bit of an understatement. Now, I need everyone to finish up their drinks. Sorry, it was a fairly quick stop at the Royal, but we need to hop back on the board, the bus again, and complete the tour. Now we're going to turn left onto East Market Street, and I'll turn the time dial forward, and uh, we'll start uh, we'll start our trip home. As we turn right onto Francis Street, if you look up at, out of the windows, you'll see uh, different aircraft landing at the aerodrome. Um, Wapiti and Demon biplanes in the 30s, as we sort of turn the dial forward, we'll see Dakotas in the 40s and 50s. And as we come forward more, Hercules and Caribou in the 60s through to the 90s. Heading into the 21st century, um, aerial traffic starts to thin out a little bit as some of the aircraft sort of move away or are retired. But the shape and sound of a Hercules uh, staying fairly consistent through that time. Now, we'll take a left onto Jersey Street, um, which will bring us back to the RAF base. As we go through the big dip and move on to Dyte Street, um, I should point out that we'll be passing the Richmond War Cemetery shortly. Amongst those interred here are uh, many of the hers who lost their lives in air crashes around the district. One more I want to touch on is um, eight people who lost their lives in December 1944, uh, when their Lockheed Hudson, as an example of which there is uh, illustrated there, uh, crashed on a, a um, post-maintenance test flight, um, actually came down. If you go down the Big Dipper, as you come back up again, uh, crashed on the land just to the left um, as you head towards the RAF base. Um, the aircraft was, as I said, conducting a post-maintenance test flight. It had actually been parked out in the field at the RAF base um, for, several, for a little while, not flying. It was pulled back into a workshop, prepared for flight again, and then pulled out and was on a test flight. Had a number of, um, I guess, joyriders on board. So there's the pilot and the crew uh, and a couple of other people with an opportunity to, uh, to go flying as well. Now, it's believed to have stalled on approach to land. We don't know if it had an engine failure or the pilot uh, or if there was a, another aircraft fault before it um, came down. Um, as I said, killed all on board, including a member of the Women's, uh, uh, women's Auxiliary Australian Air Force, sorry, I probably got that the wrong way around, um, aircraft woman Nancy Ralph. Now, I mentioned this crash not only to pay our respects as we come past the Richmond War Cemetery to uh, those that lost their lives during the war, but I also want to acknowledge the veterans who survived the war and are still with many of whom are still with us today. Uh, in this instance, um, we know of two people living in the wider Sydney area today who are meant to be on that flight. So in the last 12 months, who have reached out to Air Force and said, I was almost on that flight until um, I was called back to work or I couldn't find the form to, um, to fill out to, uh, on the manifest to fill out before I hopped on board and I didn't board it. Um, I bring that up because um, I guess our connection with the past in a lot of these instances goes beyond properties and buildings and memorials. Uh, in many instances, the, um, it's a living history that is still with us here today um, as we still have witnesses that, uh, that saw these events or were involved with them. Now, as we're approaching the RAF base, we're sort of coming to the end of our tour. I've brought the time back to the present day of 3rd of October, 2021. So after mucking around with everyone's watches and uh, time on daylight savings, hopefully we've got our, um, the correct time set. Tempted as I am to turn the time control forward and peek into, our, peek into what the future holds for RAF base Richmond in the Hawkesbury. Um, I think we're coming, yep, we've gone a little bit over time. So we unfortunately can't look at what the future holds for the, uh, for the RAF base and the Hawkesbury. Suffice to say, um, the RAF base Richmond it, it will continue to support defence operations in Sydney into the future uh, and continue being one of our main air mobility bases uh, in Australia. And I think recent examples like the introduction of the New South Wales uh, Rural Fire Service, the large air tanker fleet um, and other activities that we've conducted in the area um, have demonstrated the value of uh, the base, uh, especially as a piece of infrastructure within this community. Now, Thank you everyone for joining me on this uh, virtual tour. Um, I, my primary sources, as I said, I'm not a historian. My primary sources for this were uh, Trove, the National Archive, and there's a series of books um, that have been written about different periods of rough based Richmond's history that I'm happy to discuss. Um, as we drive through the main gate, our time is up, but I'm happy to hang around and answer any questions you may have. Thank you.